I have a black slide at the beginning and end of all my presentations <clears throat> to remind me that if I don't do this right, everybody will be in the dark. Okay, it's just it's what it is. Now we have, we have gone through these evidences for creation, which basically was the same thing that my professor brought in, and he said these are the evidences that that for evolution, where's your evidence, David? And I couldn't tell him then. I had to say, I need some time to think about that. Don't ever feel bad about doing that, okay? Because then you really do have some time to think about it. And the, I think they'll always grant you that. People are pretty considerate when it comes to that. So we've dealt with the similarities in organisms. We haven't dealt with vestigial organs, and sometime I could do that for you, but there's probably five other lessons that I could do uh, and some evidences lessons. I had an entire year's worth. So I, had, I think I had 52 lessons on evidences that I did at Expressway. Uh, genetics, we talked about uh, special evolution. We really concentrated on the idea of natural selection and the fact that mutations, you know, we may, they may chide us for pointing at miracles, but what they do is they use uh, mutations to, to, uh, as their miracles. When they don't have an answer, they say there's a mutation. When we don't have an answer, we say there was a miracle. But our miracles are documented, and, and the mutations are not. So anyway, so we have, we have the whole concept of genetics. We've done with paleontology, and we dealt with fossil man. And I hope that the thing on fossil man was really helpful for you. You know, that is, to me, one of the clearest places where a small amount of evidence has a whole lot of interpretation wrapped around it. And even if you had a full fossil for every one of the things that they had, and you knew that's what it was, you couldn't tell whether any of those things were human or non-human without looking at their behavior, their culture, their customs, you know, all of the things that they did. Many of the ones that we thought were so primitive for so long, perhaps the intermediate fossil, that transitional fossil, we now know that they had religion, they buried their dead. I mean, Neanderthaler, we, we now know that it was fully human. You know, so... Yeah, when you have something that you can't explain, sometimes you just have to wait for a while. And you're going to find out that, that, you know, there's other evidence that they find that kind of sets it aside. We're still trying to find the fossil ancestors of apes and humans, and we haven't done it yet. There's no indication we've ever done it. Remember, I showed you Wilt the Stilt and Willie Shoemaker. Just think about the difference just in their skeletons. You know, just their skeletons and how different they would have been looked at in the fossil record. So the age of the earth, uh, this is another one where I kind of had to write my own. The, the earth is older than man's recorded history. Okay, so when I say that somebody is older than dirt, that's a sin. Because <laughs> that is not what the Bible says. <laughs> okay, sort of, but not quite. Okay. The earth is older than man's recorded history. And to me, that's the simplest thing you can say about what we know about the age of the earth. We know it's older than anything we have recorded. All right, so let's start there. This is from a gen these are all general evolutionists. If oak trees and humans share a common ancestor, that ancestor had to live very long ago. That's just a basic statement of how they would interpret this. If they come from a common ancestor, then that had to start a long time ago, okay? Uh, time is the hero of the plot. A lot of people will criticize me for using George Wall's statement. Uh, he was a biochemist, and I found this in one of my classes. I mean, we were studying out of a Scientific American book that was put together very specifically for what we were talking about on evolution. And one of the articles was on the the evolution, uh, the chemical evolution. And, and what he says in that is time is the hero of the plot. The time with which we have to deal is in the order of 2 billion years. What we regard as um, impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible. And the possible, probable, and the probable, virtually certain. 
One only has to wait. Time performs the miracles. Well, you know, you could take the same quote, say the same thing about God. You know, the amount of time that we're dealing with makes our speculations meaningless. The Bible says God created. You know, that he created man. Satan was in the world. Sin came into the world. A promise was made for redemption. And Jesus came. You know, you know sin and salvation go together. So, you know, this would fit for us too. What they regard as impossible on the basis of our, their human experience would be meaningless. No matter what view you take. If you have so much time... That thing you think is impossible that God created becomes possible, et cetera, et cetera. It fits the same concept. So th this is one that they say I've taken out of context, uh, but I didn't. I took it right out of my class and the way it was used in my class. Um, the alternative to special creation, they focus in specifically on special creation, uh, namely the idea of uh, continuity and historical succession, evolution had occurred to a number of thinkers. Some of these recognize that any concept of evolution, uh, in here, if I were doing this and I had more time tonight, I would make you try to figure out every time he, the use of the word evolution is in there, whether they're talking about special or general. Now, you probably can see it right off the bat, but any time you come on the word evolution, I don't care who you are. You need to ask yourself, is this chemical? Is this general evolution? Or is this natural selection? Because it makes all the difference in the world. You have to remember that everything that is used to support general evolution has to do with special evolution, natural selection. Every example in the books comes from special evolution. Peppered maws. Uh, giraffe neck links and things like that. They all come straight out of that. Okay. So anyway, obviously, if if uh, general evolution occurred, you'd have to have a much older Earth. I would agree with that. Okay. Now, there's several things that were used to actually uh, do this. The first one actually had to do with biblical chronology. And most people say uh, 4,000 to 6,000 maybe 10,000 years. But the thing in the Bible that puts a limit on that is always the genealogies. Now, they're not always father-son, but you can't, you can't account for uh, billions of years with something like that. There's small differences, but it's still going to come out in that 10,000. Most people might go to 20,000, but that's about it. Good to see you. Uh, anyway, so the next thing was the red shift and the expansion of the universe, and they said that the Earth could be up to 10 billion years old. Sedimentation rates brought it to 350 million. Salinity, over 100 million. Tidal friction, the Earth-Moon system of tidal friction, 2.4 billion. Radioactive decay uh, doesn't apply uh, in, re in uh, carbon-14 above 45,000 years. That's about as far as you could go, period, with uh, carbon-14 dating. And you have to have a real piece of wood if you're going to date it. You can't take a fossilized piece of wood. You have to have the real deal. Okay, living tissue. Okay, um, potassium argon up to 3 billion. Radioactive decay of rubidium to strontium up to 4 billion. Thorium to lead up to 3 billion. Radioactive decay in general in uranium to lead or lead to lead is 3 billion. So you begin to get in this sort of level of consistency in what they're saying. So the question is, how does this work? How does this whole thing work? All right. Uh, I'm not going to go all the way into the biblical stuff. I have a whole thing on Usher here. You can probably look that up on Wikipedia and, you know, Usher's thinking. You can get far more than you ever wanted to get. That appears to be the way Wikipedia works. But the experts have written it, okay? And so I find, I, I find myself reading it all the time. I'm just going to tell you, you know, I have a lot of different interests, so philosophy and, and arts and, and science and everything. I just have a lot of things. Can't help it. I still want to learn. 
But the difference in the significance of begat is important because sometimes you have a skipping of generations. So if you compare, if you compare uh, Ezra with First Chronicles, you find out that Amariah, uh, Ahab, Ah, I can't read. Is that Ahadub, Zadok, Amaz, Azariah, and you got you? Know, <laughs> how do you blur your speech? Okay. <laughs> anyway, I can't read this same same thing now. But there's a whole bunch of generations that are left out by Ezra. All right. But do I believe that generally speaking, it was to show an actual physical relationship between this person, like? Adam, all the way to Christ? Absolutely. Is every generation in there? Not necessarily. But they they had to know as much as they could about their genealogy from all those Old Testament sources to be able to trace their families back. Now, they can't do that anymore. Now, just a side point here. It's not possible for anyone who calls themselves a Jew today to actually be able to go back and figure out what tribe they were from. Because they were scattered when the temple was destroyed, when they went into captivity and things like that. They, it was gone. They have no way of knowing. But that's a side point. Just wanted you to be aware. So this begins to look pretty consistent here, but it's in terms of the rocks. And the rocks alone, in the crust of the earth. And we'll come back to that in a minute. You can do limit uh, these little areas of local application like tree rings or spilothemes or corals or ice cores. Uh, this is a guy doing varves, all right, ice cores, I mean uh, spilothemes and ice cores. And uh, they have technology to do that. You can core down into the Arctic ice and you will find <laughs> summer and winter uh, the same kind of thing that you find in tree rings where the, uh, as you get farther through the growing season, the cells get smaller and smaller. And then in the spring, there's this big burst of water and life and you have bigger cells and that gives you that effect of the tree ring. And it's the same thing and they can measure it. But here's the key. What they're going to talk about is the, is the idea of the decay. The decay from uranium-238 down to lead-206. Now, I need to explain uh, how radioactive materials work. I'm going to do this in the simplest way I can. What you have is unstable atoms that sling particles off. And when they sling the particle off, it changes their atomic numbers and things like that, and it actually changes what you're dealing with. So uranium can go to thorium, and then to polonium and uranium and thorium and but there are different numbers because it just keeps slinging these particles off, like alpha particles and so on. And that's what an unstable element does. But eventually, it will reach a stable state. You know, lead-206 is quite stable, and it stays as lead-206. So the question is, how long does it take for this to occur for a uranium-238 atom? Okay? Now... When I think about these uh, dating things, okay, uh, the biggest time sweeps, the hour hand on this clock the, is uranium-238 to lead-206 or thorium-232 to lead-208. That would be the slowest, the, the longest half-life, as they say, and it just takes a long time for that to occur, all right? And that's where they measure the billions of years. The second hand, basic, the minute hand is potassium argon. All right, many of you have heard of potassium argon dating, but it's kind of like the, the minute hand, and it measures things, uh, rocks that are in the order of uh, millions, not a, not a billion, just millions of years, okay? Then you get down to the second hand, which is, carbon-14, which requires a different source. It has to be, it would have to be a piece of wood that was caught in the rock, but it was the piece of wood. You'd have to actually have that. And so uh, I can explain that in a minute, but that would be the, the shortest period of time. And then there are some that are just so, so fast that within, oh, it's gone already. 
It's a little radioactive and click. Oh, that's gone again. Well, they are fast, you know. And so what we have is some really uh, fast decay curves for certain elements that are in the that are in the rocks themselves. So anyway, this is a decay curve, and it's very <clears throat> it's very simple, even though it sort of defies logic. <clears throat> Whatever the decay is. Let's say it's 5,400 and 506. What is it for carbon-14? 5,280. 5,280. Uh, was that? I was. Anyway, 5,280 5, years. If you have a, a glob of carbon-14, if you're measuring carbon-14, in 5,280 years, half of it will be gone. So whatever you started with, you now have half. In another 5,280 years, you will have half of that. So you're going to have this. In another 5,280 years, you're going to have half of that. I can't do this with my fingers. <laughs> yes, I just want you to think about the old riddle that said, if you, uh, if you go from San Antonio to New York City, and in that trip you go half the distance each day, when will you get there? And the joke is that you won't ever get there. <clears throat> and technically, this would continue to go on in all radioactive decay. And it will form this kind of a curve. It's kind of a deceleration curve, okay? When you first start to uh, de decelerate from 70 miles an hour, it's much slower. But when you get down behind that car that stopped at the stoplight, you can stop a lot faster with the same pressure on the brake. So anyway, <clears throat> this idea of a de decay curve, I've run one of these with the head of the, of the physics department in an honors class. We had a fast decay uh, substance in a counter. We took the counts, and when you took the counts, basically during the class period, it decayed, and you could actually chart out this thing. You come up with one of these curves. I have no problem with that. Uh, so the question is, what do you do? In carbon-14, to me, when you get down to 20,000 uh, 20, years, or surely by 30,000, there would be so little left. I don't even see why they went to 47,000 years. I just don't understand why they even gave that date. When you got past 20,000 years with carbon-14, you just haven't got anything left. So the question, just so you know... What is carbon-14? It is a radioactive form of carbon that is taken up into the bodies of all living things. All right. And technically, it should be at an equilibrium with the amount that's being formed in the earth and atmosphere with what is decaying. And that's a big question mark. It's, not, it's still building up if the earth is 50,000 years old. And it would it might it would take a long time for it to reach that stability. Without without even thinking about that, what happens is you have a certain amount of carbon fourteen in your body, and as long as you're living, you build up that carbon carbon fourteen. And when you die, that's the end of it. You're not taking any more carbon in, and so that's your original supply to measure. And then you have what's left over, and the rate at which it decays. Now, what I've tried to do is to think about that like this little girl with her sparkler. Uh, you give a person a sparkler, you have a certain amount of decay material. All right. You light it and it begins to sling off particles and it keeps moving down and slinging off particles and then it stops. And you have all of your residual. You have all the stuff that's left. So what they're saying is, <clears throat> we can do this if we know how much was there at the beginning, how much is there at the end, and we know the rate of decay. All right, now the assumption is that the rate of decay cannot and has not ever changed. That's the assumption that they make. And that's where I'm going with this talk. And I'm not going in the way that most people normally go at it, as you might expect. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> I've had this problem all week, and I thought I had it covered for an hour. <laughs> Apparently not. Initial conditions, when, the, when it was first lit, the final condition, the residue that is left on the piece of metal, 
and then the rate at which it decayed. All right. Now, with these sparklers, I don't see a constant decay rate because mine always ran out before my, my brother and my sister. I was stuck with the very fastest acting, and I didn't get as much fun out of it. I always like to throw them up in the air, you know, not like that's dangerous. Don't do that, kids. All right. So uh, it comes down, and this actually is from somebody who would have to be classed as a creationist. It's Robert Gentry. He's a physicist working at Oak Ridge uh, Laboratories outside of Knoxville. Oak Ridge is still there. And uh, he just kept saying, you know, that basic assumption is that you can't change the rate of decay. Now, a, a while before that, Arthur Holmes had already stated that there were three possibilities. Uranium may have disintegrated in the same way in the past, uh, exactly like it does now, or it may have decayed more slowly or rapidly. All right, so what's going on now may be exactly the same, or it may be faster, or it may be slower. And most people have set aside the idea that it could be changed, that it, you could actually change the rate of decay. So it's kind of like that John Cameron Swayze. This is not for you kids, but for anybody who still knows John Cameron Swayze, that would be you two, you two, you two, me, Todd. He's, okay, this idea of having heard of him is not enough. You have to have seen the Timex commercials where he threw it into a blowhole down, <laughs> down in the Hawaii and it blew it sky high and it landed on the rock. It takes a licking and it keeps on ticking. So no matter where it was in that process, it was ticking away at exactly the right rate. Okay, and that, that's the idea that radioactive materials can take a licking, but they can keep on ticking and they tick at the same rate and that can never be changed. And if that's true, then we know something about the absolute age of the rocks, okay? So the suggestion that um, the disintegration could be faster, uh, slower, would set aside any possibility that you could calculate the age by radioactivity methods. So if it goes faster or slower ever, then you have a reason to question whether radioactive uh, dating methods are accurate, okay? Now, most scientific creationists deal with this in a different way than I do. Uh, what happened was that Robert Gentry started studying polonium-214, uh, I believe it was. I'll come back to it in a minute. I have it on one of my charts. He was doing one of these uh, polonium ones, and... He, he said from his studies that it wasn't constant, and he had proven that it wasn't constant. And, of course, everybody picked up on that because that's what many people had been suggesting for a long time who were, quote, creationists. Okay, you are a creationist, so we're talking about a general evolutionary uh, side and the creationist side where they don't make that distinction. So... Polonium-214, and I want you to understand this. The half-life is 164 microseconds. Oh, it's already gone again. And again, and again, and again. 164 uh, microseconds is, I, I don't have anything to compare it to. If it's sitting here, it's gone already, okay? According to one theory of the planet's origin, the Earth cooled down from a hot gaseous mass and gradually solidified over a period of hundreds of millions of years. If this were so, polonium halos could not possibly have uh, formed, formed uh, because all the polonium would have decayed as soon as it was synthesized, and it would have been extinct by the time the crust itself formed. You have to understand that the only way that you could get any kind of fingerprint for these things is for the crust to be solid. Because you know all those little particles that are being thrown out? Those are like bullets. And they crack the crust in a very specific way. And they leave halos. And those are fingerprints for every radioactive material. There is a specific fingerprint in the halo. All right? So that was what Gentry was working with. 
And so th this was his conclusion. Unless the creation of life, of radioactivity, and the rocks were simultaneous, there'd be no picture. There would be no variant Pleochroic halos. Further, by the very short half-life, the radioactive activity in the formation of the rocks would have to be almost instantaneous. All right. So the idea is if you have things that have a half-life that short and you have a fingerprint, you have to have a crustal rock, a solid matrix rock. You can't have some kind of flowing magma. You can't have a gaseous mass. And so there wouldn't be any kinds of marks like that in the rocks, and yet we have them. So a lot of debate has gone on over this particular thing. Uh, now, these are the kinds of things that special, I mean, that scientific, scientific creationists, okay, uh, bring up. So like uh, a mollusk, like a clam or so on, snails, that have their shells that are dated by carbon-14 up to 2,300 years. New wood from actively growing trees has been dated by the same method as 10,000 years. Okay, that kind of thing. But the one that really got me uh, was one over here. It was this pillow lump. And I've looked at all of these examples for years, you know, but there was something in the pillow lava that really got my attention. I went back to the original article and I found out that the scientific creationists really misrepresented the article. And I've tried to tell people, if you're going to go back and you want to look at this stuff, you better go back to the original article and read it yourself. So I went back and I read the research study. So this is one of the things that was said about it by uh, scientific creationists. The evidence that radio clocks have actually uh, been deranged uh, is clear from the many dating errors of objects of known age. Okay, they mention this, they mention that. And then they say, for example, lava from Hawaiian and other volcanoes around the world that is known to have flowed within the last 200 years has been dated by the potassium, argon, and uranium lead uh, thorium at thousands of millions of years. See, isn't that a billion? Thousands of millions is billions, okay? I don't know why they didn't just write that in. Surely this demonstrates that the assumptions used in dating techniques are not only truly assumptions, but often truly wrong. And that was how scientific creationists used it. So I went back and read the article uh, from the scientist who did the study. And what I found was that the dating did change, okay, when hot lava pours into the ocean, most of you've probably seen that, right? The pictures of red hot lava coming off the Hawaiian uh, volcanoes into the ocean. And it forms very, very quickly. It forms a crust around it. But in that article, the scientists said, we're predicting that will happen. It's not going to show consistent aging. That was their prediction. And they actually showed that. So to pull it out and say, Oh, yeah, look what they found. And it was, you know, that's what they were shooting for. Well, that made me think about it. If you, if you think about the earth being molten lava and having to cool down, you've got the problem of the polonium halos. Same thing on the moon, by the way. <clears throat> the polonium halos, which could not have survived that long a time as it cooled down. There would be no fingerprints because there's no solid matrix rocks to have these particles form uh, the halos. And, and so without that, you basically having, have all of them disappearing very quickly. I'm, I'm talking about a lot of stuff, not just the polonium halos. All right. But what, what their, their own article told me was they were predicting that the rate of decay would not come out the same that you could affect the rate of decay by this process of forming the rock. And I thought, well, that's just what I'm saying, that the rate of decay actually can be changed by the way the rock is formed. And if so, why not? I mean, that was what their article said. And so I don't know whether they realized what they were saying, but what they were saying is what many of us have said for years. While 
in the, it, it seems to be very, very constant, but don't tell us it can't be changed because that's what this was all about. They looked at it, they expected it to be changed, and it was changed. So don't tell me that if God created the crustal rocks in his creation, and they went from whatever they were before to solid rock, that that doesn't say something about why the halos are there. And so the whole idea is that the way rocks form then implies that you might be able to change the rate of decay and not get consistent readings. So this is the direction I've decided to go. You, you may be learning a whole lot more about the process by which a rock is formed than the actual time date. You know, and we need to look at this. I mean, just because everything we've studied so far says it one way does not mean it was different in the past. I go back to that article they wrote about creationists, you know, the, the amount of time, it, you know, and, and so on. It's just... Uh, the idea is, uh, sorry, the idea is basically that you, you either can change it or you can't change it. So if you're going to say it can't be changed, you can't take this research thing seriously. If you take it seriously, then you're basically saying it can be changed by the way that the rock was created. And so rather than debating about, you know, snails and things like that, where you might change the date by never more than 10% of what they're saying the date is, if you can show things like this, that, that the, the date uh, can't be given because of the change it's going through in the way the rock is formed, then you start thinking about God creating an instantaneously speaking the earth into existence, meaning there's an immediate matrix of all these rocks, and that explains pleochroic halos. And it, does, and it, does, it just says that you can change the rate of decay, period, by the way you form the rocks. And I know that this one is a little bit, it's certainly a lot more technical, and I apologize for that. But what this has done for me is it has just opened the door to realize that the formation of these rocks basically could change the, the whole, all the dates. And we know so little from our own personal experience. I mean, how long has it, you know, if, if intelligent man has been here 4,000 years, and I believe we have been, and intelligence has been pretty remarkable because we've seen from pretty remarkable things, you know, built within the last 4,000 years. Uh, and even if it goes back 10,000 years, I believe that humans were unique in their abilities. And that shows up in the artifacts that we find. So we are unique. And within that period of time, is that enough with our study of science? Radioactive decay was discovered in 1900. One, right around the turn of the century between the 1800s and the 1900s. So we've been studying this for a very short period of time. And to make it a, a broad brush sweep that all of these seem to be alike for this reason without knowing what was going on before or the impact of miracles that God did, you know, like the flood and all sorts of things that he did to this earth, both in the creation and in the destruction of the people at that time. It's just, to me, it just oversteps the bounds of, of saying what you actually know. The fact that it does it now doesn't mean it's always done that. And that one study is enough for me to understand that, how the rocks are formed. Now, what I, what I want to do is simply thank you guys for all the attention you've given me. Um, the whole thing about vestigial organs is that vestigial organs are not in as a topic anymore in the books. They are, they've gone away, which is the whole, what's the whole argument, but it's a very interesting history, but I don't have time to give that one. 
And the science, um, the idea of design, uh, whether people want to admit it as creationist, this is really Paley's argument that you got to watch, you find it on the seashore, et cetera, et cetera. It's really no different. It doesn't mean it's wrong. So it, I would have you just look around this room and look at anything, okay? What are you looking at? You tell me something you're looking at. Podium. The podium itself. What else do you see in the room, kids? They don't count. <laughs> I'm not going to grade them down. I'm just going to tell you that right off. So what about the visual system here and the computer and all of that? Some pretty complicated stuff in here. Can you imagine, in your own mind, is it reasonable to believe that any of these things came into existence naturally? That these, all of this organization of, of atoms and molecules and so on was put together as an accident with no intelligence behind it. I, I'm not talking about my, my lessons. Let's, <laughs> let me eliminate that one right off the bat. But the truth is, you can't conceive of the clock or the, the projectors or the computer or this. And yet, in science, they are asking us to believe that the most unique, most complex, most unbelievably designed thing in this room was an accident. And that would be us. I mean, I, it, it's not even reasonable to me. We understand that there's some really neat things. You can take the hollowed out concept in the wing of a bird that makes birds so light, reduces so much of their weight when they're flying, and you can apply that to, a, to the wing of an airplane. Great. You took something that you found in nature and you adapted it. All right, that's not the proper word. You were able to use it for uh, something that humans can take advantage of, but you did not create it. You just used what was already created. The old, the old joke about that was somebody said, I, you know, I can, uh, I can make an earth like this from the dust. And they reach down, they pick up the dust and God says, whoop, got to use your own dust, make your own dust first. You know, it's that whole concept. Now, We've gone the same amount of time that we have. I tried to do the paleontology as a review for a reason, and I'm glad I did now because of losing that one uh, precious, incredible, phenomenal pres <laughs> presentation that I made. <laughs> but I could always redo that one for you. But I just felt like I needed to go back and pick that up and do a review on it. This one's more complex. There's two things I would suggest, okay? One is to go through uh, your textbooks. The other one is to take the reading that you had before I came here and go back and read it with this in your mind. Uh, I, I found out over the years that people think they understand it the first time. They begin to understand it the second time they hear it. And by the third time, I'm brilliant. They, you know... One of the elders at Expressway, it had been like 10 years since he ever heard me do this. And he says, man, you just did such a better job on that presentation. And I'm thinking, I haven't changed anything, you know. But he, he had had it in his head all that time, and it had begun to make more and more sense to him. And I, I highly recommend this approach so that when somebody says, are you a creationist? or an evolutionist, you can stop them in their tracks by saying, yes. Yes, I am. And they're not going to know what you mean, and you're going to have that opportunity at that point to move into this discussion in a very calm, reasonable, logical way. And if you don't think you can do it, you all have my number. You know, I've done presentations for people on request with one, other, with one person there. I don't care if there's one person there. That's one person more than I did it, did before. God bless you guys. Keep up the good work here.
you know, pray a lot for your preacher, he needs it. <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> whoa, that must have been a low-level joke. <laughs> that must have been a remedial joke. Anyway, uh, anyway, the point is I want to thank you, and I'm going to stop. If you have a couple of questions tonight, that's fine. I'm going to probably leave it at, at two because I know this could really go long. Yes? You talk mainly about the problems with the assumptions of the fixed rate and decay, but don't they also have to assume something about the initial amount of whatever was there? I'm going to repeat this. I probably should have been repeating the question as best I could all along because the microphone's right up here. Yes, the problem of initial conditions and final conditions is just as important as the rate of decay. I remember my friend John Clark had one book that dealt with this whole issue issue of radio dating. And they spent 200 pages on how they could assure knowing initial and final conditions. And like 10 pages on the rate of decay. Can they nail it down? Yes, they can in many, many cases. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I agree with you. You could debate all day long about knowing the initial conditions, but you can see how difficult that would be. How could you know how much was there that long ago that nothing had gone away, nothing had been added? You know, like potassium argon, the argon part is a gas. So how do you know that this gas, which is in the atmosphere, in high concentration, has not been added to, you haven't had any loss, and you know what the initial condition is. The main reason they're doing it is because of this sort of consistency in the date that they get from these different, these different uh, procedures. But yes, you're absolutely right. You know, nailing down the initial conditions, that's easy on a, on a sparkler. You can measure it before. You can measure what the final conditions are. You can weigh both of them. And you can, you can watch and time the rate of decay for that amount of material. But that gets really, really tricky in the rocks. And they'll say they've got it all nailed down, but they don't. They have just as many problems there. I, I want to say one other thing as I finish. If you ask a radio chemist what the greatest, strongest evidence is for general evolution, they will not point to radio dating. They will point to what paleontologists study, not their area. If you talk to a paleontologist about the strongest evidence for general evolution, they will point you to the geneticists, not to their you know, to what they do as uh, vertebrate uh, paleontologists and so on. And I have even more examples of that that I did not uh, try to cover in this. And so basically everybody says, oh, yeah, they, they proved it, and I'm just adding to it. And then you go to that specialty, and they point to somebody else who is really dealing with special evolution and natural selection. And it just goes round and round like that, you know. They never really use their own area as evidence, as saying it's the strongest evidence. And you can test that with, you can test that with people. You know, I went into a, a genetics class with Dr. Ostrowski, who has done genetics on fruit flies for his whole career up in, uh, must have been in Concord, North Carolina. And the preacher there had gotten me the opportunity to come and talk to the genetics class, which I'm sure was undergraduate. I'm sure there were graduate students there, although he never actually said that to me. And at the very beginning, you know, he said, uh, if you're going to use that fruit fly thing, I just want you to know I've been studying them my entire career. I said, no problem. But when I went through the fruit flies, he had no answer for what I said. You know, the way I approached it was different than the stuff that he had heard. And I had the scientific background to, to answer the questions that were in the classroom. Now, you may not be able to do that. I don't think that God's expecting you to become an expert in every discipline of, uh, of study. 
but he probably wants you to know who you could talk to or find somebody that they could talk to uh, other than yourself. And there will always be those people out there. You know, there are really serious archaeologists who are Christians, you know, and still have their strong belief in a God who created, who had miracles, miraculous contacts with mankind over the years. So, you know, you can find very, uh, you can find that all over. So just remember that thing about pointing. Just ask your genetics professor what they think the strongest evidence is that general evolution occurred and see what they say. I almost guarantee they're not going to say genetics. Just see if I'm right on that. It's hard to stop. Thank you very much. I've stopped. God bless y'all.